David and Cameron. And the first question is for you guys. Should we lower the voting age to 16? Would that incentivize schools to teach civic engagement earlier and with more urgency? I think schools could just teach civic engagement earlier and with more urgency. <laughs> okay. fact, so you're not for... Yeah. We're taking our Gov class senior year, and that's when most people, I believe, take their Gov class. I think we should be doing that every year. Because that's what we Is that have... what we used to call civics? Yeah. Gov class. Gov that's class. what they call that's it. That's what my AP that's Gov class. That's, that's what the kids bottom. these days call it. And, they, and they teach you, like, how government works. Like, yeah. Like things, like, Trump yeah. doesn't know. Like, there are three branches. Mm -hmm. There are three branches? <laughs> House, the Senate, Supreme Court, that kind of stuff? Right. Yeah. Well, no, it's, I, I pre-registered to vote the other day, and um, I, I think that's what we need to be doing, because it, it, right now, a lot of the kids my age are voting the way their mommies and daddies are voting. And that's a little daunting to, to think about us. I mean, that still happens when people are adults, but, you know, th there could be a little bit more freedom as it, as it goes on. And again, that's the number one predictor of uh, what political party you'll be part of is your parents' past. And that's terrifying to think about, considering uh, that our parents have failed us. Oh, yeah. You really don't like us. Yeah, yeah they're people. in the audience. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at you. We are. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's not piss off the kids any more than we That's already right. have, all right? Yeah, it's, yeah, just give it's, us some time. Let's, let's, I know. Let's be real. How do y'all really feel? Yeah. <laughs> um, don't filter it. Don't yeah. filter it. Come on. How do we feel about... You're being very subtle. Tide Pods yeah. or gun reform? Um, so, yeah. Go well, ahead. the way I feel about gun reform is we, need to have, we don't have many limitations on the Second Amendment right now. I, I believe in owning a gun. My father has a gun. Cameron's dad has a gun, I believe. Um, both our parents were in law enforcement. I do see the reason to, be, the reason to have a, a weapon, and I do see the reasoning behind the Second Amendment, but I think we should have limitations on the Second Amendment the same way we have limitations on the First, where you can't scream fire in a crowded theater. You shouldn't be able to get an AR-15 if you're a mentally unstable individual. I don't get what's so hard for people to understand about that. I'm not trying to take your gun. Remember, remember when... Remember when uh... oh. Remember when slavery was a thing and women weren't allowed to vote and we did something about that? You know. It took a while. Well, but yeah. you know, if the only thing that comes out of this tragedy is that we outlaw bump stocks and we raise the age at which people are allowed to buy an AR-15, that will be a failure. That will yeah. be a failure. Because the reality, from my perspective, is you need to do what we've always tried to do, which is to ban the sale of AR-15s, have universal background checks, um, and also take away the ability to buy these large see, magazines. See, but the problem with that is it makes way too much fucking sense for our elected officials to take care of. Yeah, yeah and there's also... A, there's a study that was out today from the RAND Corporation that shows that these kinds of measures actually have an impact on gun violence. Yeah. I mean, there's empirical evidence now that shows that. Uh, what's your opinion on, like, the, the fact that the CDC can't research most of this stuff? And, like, and as... that's another thing that has to... This guy, Dickie... The Dickie. That's his name. Yeah. Um, this congressman... <laughs> This congressman put in the funding for the CDC the, so they were unable to study the, uh, the impact of gun violence yeah. and the causes of gun violence. And that's another thing that has to be... Yeah. Who is this guy? He, he's a... His name was Dickie. I, I know, but, yeah. but he's, he's a, <laughs> he's a my, legislator? That was my yeah, nickname he's a congressman. I think, I think football Mark, team. I think he was a congressman from Arkansas. Right? Oh, oh, yes. He's yeah. like the and Republican's wiener. Yeah. The other thing is... Uh, um, just Anthony wiener, thing. what do you think I meant? What's up with ATF having, like, all of their records be paper? Like, that's just insane. And that's required by law, right? Required by law passed by Republicans who want to hobble ATF. When we've tried to modernize these things and keep the records in the way any other corporation or big entity would, keep them electronically, Republicans have said, no, you can't do that. Limit the amount of time that you can hold on to these things and so that you have to keep them. Okay. You can't use we them have other issues to get to. Uh, John Meacham, would the Founding Fathers agree with Billy Graham lying in honor at the U.S. Capitol? Probably just because it, was, it, would, be a, it would not be a violation of church and state in so much as a, real, a recognition of a, of a cultural figure. Um, Madison, who wrote the Bill of Rights and was a hugely important uh, thinker about religious liberty, was actually presented with a case uh, late in his life about why is the U.S. military paying for chaplains? Mm -hmm. Isn't that a violation of the Establishment Clause? Almost certainly, in a, in a strict sense. But he said some things are just not worth fighting. And um, I think that's where we'd probably stand. Uh, Eric, if you're in Jeff Sessions' current position, would you resign? 
Uh, I mean, it, 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 when I read the... When you read these tweets where Trump is going on, and it, lo it looks like this is the kind of tweet you would write if you were in the opposition party. Why isn't the attorney general... Wait, he's your attorney general. Right. It's so through the looking glass. Yeah. And uh, Jeff Sessions... Did, I mean, you have nothing in common with him. He's a Confederate soldier. Um, <laughs> he said that. He's done it. Do you feel sorry for him? Do you feel something? No, I mean, he took this job knowing who Donald Trump was. Right, um, and who he is. Right, and, you know, at, at some point, though, you would hope that you would have the intestinal fortitude or the pride to simply say, you know, I wanted this job all my life, but it's not worth it. And um, I'm not going to take that kind of abuse. And I'm simply going to tell you, you know, go screw yourself, and I'm out. But he's kind of doing a service for the country by not doing that. Because if, right, John, don't you agree? If he, if he left, then Trump could appoint someone who would fire Mueller. Here is a sign of where we are in March of 2018. Jeff Sessions has become a pillar of democratic order. <laughs> right. But you're right. It's true. But you're right. A man it's who true. could not be confirmed for the federal bench. Right. Right? Right. Uh, Amy, is there any one particular cause that you see has the potential to unite the many different tribes in America? Is there anything? I think it's pot, but yeah, you go you ahead. Yeah, you betcha that. You betcha. Um, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Well, it's um, one of the few things that does unite uh, red and blue America. Um, you know, conservatives smoke pot. Yeah, you know, I, I think of it differently. How I do you mean, explain I... Ted Nugent? Jeff Sessions. Well, you know, I mean, like for the Olympics, people come together. I mean, a, a, a little. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I not think. The I, I, We're I not going to rally around. No, the no, Olympics. not to see out. I think, I, I think that um, if if um, if people, well, the studies that are most optimistic in my book are that if you actually pull people out of their tribes, and have them interact as human beings. Um, enormous progress can be made. So, really? for example, the integration of the military in the 50s was right. one where everybody said, there's no way this is going to work. And they went through, and then afterwards there was it a study... ended prejudice in America. <laughs> what, what, no, but what the study showed that the integrated units were, right. um, you know, sure. equal or superior to... And what they said was when you're forced, actually, right. to live with people, with talk with people, them, and, and your them. lives are in their hands, you, 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 you see each other as human beings. So, and same attitudes towards same-sex marriage, too, actually dramatically changed when people started seeing these people uh, as their neighbors, their children. You know, um, it went from like 90% disapproval to 62% approval in just 30 years. Yeah. It's and hard to demonize somebody that you know or a group yeah. that you know. It's yeah. hard right. to demonize those folks. So we yeah. should introduce the Democrats to the Republicans. No, it's not just exposure. The studies also show that just diversity and exposure is not enough. That can make you hate each other more. You have to actually interact with each other as human beings. And that's the hard part, when it's you are so tribal, right? I mean, that's it's, in a circle. It's no mistake that the civil rights movement, the women's movement, uh, the, the victory in the Cold War ultimately came after the mixing experiment of World War II. The, the sailors on PT-109 were people that Jack Kennedy would never have... They, might, they would have carried his bag into a hotel. Right. And <laughs> yeah. he swam through the Pacific to right. save them. Mm -hmm. And right. he remembered them as he, as he came through. And, and the prosperity was important. I just... You know, we always... The tribes come together, but it's always brief, and then it, it begins to fall apart again. I wouldn't over-romanticize the past. But I don't think it's assimilation I'm talking about. I mean, I think where I get my optimism is I, as I say in this book, I think that alone among the major powers were what I call a supergroup. That is, we, uh, this is not saying that we've met all these ideals, but that we have this overarching national identity um, that's strong. You know, not like Libya or, or, but it's strong. And at the same time, we allow well, uh, individual subgroup identities to flourish. So they don't all have to melt away. I mean, we, and I think it's, if you look through all the different powers, not, not England, not France, they have one or the other. But it's strong because it's built around ideas that and we're all different, but we are all, we all cut into the same idea. And that is what I think is going away. It is, but is, what Eric's doing is so important too, because you can't, just getting people to, how do you get people to buy into this national identity unity? It's not just by cheering the anthem very loudly, right? You have, the system has to seem legitimate hmm. and the dream has to seem accessible to all. Otherwise, well, people aren't going to buy into it. We have so, got our work cut out for us. Thank you, you very much, everybody. You were a terrific audience and, of course, a terrific panel.